Hello and welcome to Let's Play Disciples 2 Gold with your host as always, Madurai Bread. Now, this is going to be a crazy long Let's Play that I'm very happy I'm finally getting around to, so the playlist is in the description if you want to see how long this is. We're going to be going through the saga of all five teams in this game, and the fifth one being the Elves, which were added in this newest expansion, Rise of the Elves. Before we get into that, though, let's hit up the intro, because I love it. The prison is dying. A decade ago, the first great wars had spread blood throughout the lands. The mounting clans were slaughtered. Half of their realm fled behind their great runic portal. The others driven mad out of fear of the Ragnarok. For in their dreams, they saw their own dark fate. The Empire was governed by a feeble monarch. He mourned the loss of his beloved queen and heir. The children of the Empire sing death songs. An Empire without an heir could only portend more chaos. Alright, so clearly the Empire and the Mountain Clans are falling to the Legion of the Damned. Which means... For our first saga, the sagas being the story mode ones, where you carry over characters, and we can pick between the Elven Alliance, Mountain Clans, Legion of the Damned, the Empire, and the Undead Hordes, we're going to be starting with the campaign of the Legions of the Damned. They're not my favorite team to play, although probably my second favorite team to play, but god I love them. So, of course, we're mid-dry bread, we can pick our portrait, which I think I like this one the most. Let's just check all of them real quick. Yeah, just the four for them? Okay. We're gonna be on average difficulty. And the first big choice of the game is your lord. What kind of a lord are you going to be? Well, the warrior lord can regenerate 15% of the health of every unit in his empire every single day for free. This is an incredibly powerful ability. Also, your starting hero will be the melee hero, the fighter hero. The mage lord is the only lord who can cast 5th level magic, of course, on stages that allow 5th level magic. He pays half the, uh, half the cost for researching a spell, which is what gives you the ability to cast it, and normally you can only cast each individual spell once a day. He can cast it twice. He, of course, starts with the wizard hero. And lastly, the Guildmaster. Probably the least useful one, but the most fun. The Guildmaster uh, is also limited to 4th level magic, but his thieves, instead of just being able to do very basic things like challenging the enemy leader to a duel, or um, getting information on an enemy team's city, or poisoning a party, he gains many, many new actions, like trying to assassinate the weakest member of the party. Very, very good actions, actually. On top of that, you cost it costs half this, the gold to make a city grow. And uh, growing a city makes the garrison bigger there, so you can more easily defend that city. And cities spread your land, of course. So, it's very useful to have those. You can also make units from them. And you can, of course, heal there, so it's a good place to resupply. For the Legion of the Damned, they've got really cool magic. So I think I'm going to pick a Mage Lord to really show that off. Wise are the men who carefully plan their assaults. The legions of the damned needed no such wisdom. They do not know pain as humans do. A beast who has suffered millennia of pain pays no mind to the slash of a mere sword. When Bethrazen was imprisoned by the mountain clans a decade ago, the legions feared their doom was near. Left without the protection of a leader, they scattered, fleeing terrible reprisals and brutal inquisitions. The legions awaited the waning of the runic seal's power, the seal that would hold Bethrazen captive for a decade. A decade passed, the legions looked on as a dwarf crossed the land towards Bethrazen's mountain dungeon. 
This was no ordinary dwarf. He was the High King's son, Gimner Cloudkeeper, sent to enact rites that would strengthen the runic bonds that imprisoned Bethrizen. There were rumors that the mountain clans had discovered powers that this time would seal the gate for a century. If Gimner were to be killed before the ritual could be performed, the legions could liberate their god. All right, kill the Cloud Keeper before he seals the demonic gate. Is our first mission. This splash, nah. This splash screen you get every single start of a day. It just tells you real quick what you've earned that day. All of these are different mana crystals, of course, for casting magic, and this is gold, which you use for training people, purchasing things, anything like that. Name your first leader. So this is the mage leader that the game has given us to start with. We can, of course, purchase any hero if we have the gold, but as a mage lord, we start with a mage hero, which means he's powerful in the back row, he has very low health, and his attacks, although being the weakest of the heroes, it attacks every single enemy on the field. So it's an area of effect move. Very nice for wiping out uh, hordes of weak units or finishing off an already hurt unit. All around, I like mage lords quite a bit. What do we want to name this lord? Let's just name him a dry bread. And I think that was the game oh so subtly hinting at us that we might want to go kill the messenger before he alerts everyone. So we're just going to do the first day for this episode. So I can really run down what this game is, what's going on, so that you understand the game if you've never played it before, and then the next episode is when we really start getting underway. So this is our capital. Capitals are pretty much impossible to siege. I have never destroyed or taken over a capital in Disciples 1 or 2 in my entire life. Because they start with a unit that cannot leave the capital, but is incredibly powerful. 900 health, 95% attack chance, hits every target for 250 damage. He's basically unkillable. With 90% armor. So, he takes 90% less damage. Here is our lord. He is a mage, so he should be in the back row. And I'm actually going to take all of the potions with me. This is a life potion. It revives a dead unit at one health. And these are potions of restoration. It adds 100 health. Now, there are three things we can do in the city. We start with a magic tower because we are a mage lord, which means we don't need to build that. That is what lets us research and cast magic, which we can see here. It looks like we're limited to level 2 magic, 1 and 2 magic, for this mission, okay? This quickly shows us how much land is in whose favor, so it's just us the Mountain Clan, they of course have more than we do. You can build one structure every single day, assuming you have the gold for it. We have 450 gold right now. These buildings are your just basic other buildings, it calls it. Magic Tower, as I explained before, lets you research magic to cast. The guild is what you need to recruit thief heroes. And the temple is what you use to spend money to revive and heal your own units. The other four tabs of buildings are all upgrade paths for your units. Your non-hero units, that is. This symbol means that it's not unlocked yet in this... Uh, in this particular stage of the campaign. So in another level in the campaign, we'll be able to unlock it. So right now, we can just get the Berserker upgrade, which is for our possessed ones, which are basic melee uh, units. The upgrade path for melee units in the Legion of the Damned is not very long. Their mage path is very long. They do specialize heavily in magic. This is the upgrade path for the Cultist, which is their basic caster unit. You can either make him go into the Sorcerer Path, which just means more damage, or the Unique Witch Path, which means instead of damaging the opponent, they polymorph them to paralyze them. That path is actually smaller, but right now, since in this stage, 
the path is the same, and in the next stages we'll be able to pick um, new buildings, because you can't destroy buildings and get new ones. You had to go between stages. Uh, we It won't really matter that this gets cut off earlier. So the witch might be a good idea. This is the gargoyle upgrade path, which is very short. Gargoyles are very large units that can attack at a range, but they have a very heavy natural armor to them. So marble gargoyles are very nice mage killers. And lastly, for support units, demons. This is the other thing we specialize in, is we have very upgradable special units, or uh, support units. Our support units are massive demons that are complete physical tanks and deal a ton of damage. First, let's figure out exactly what kind of party we want. Now, as any starting hero, we have a leadership of three, which means that we can have three units with us, or three panels of units. If we are to take a big one, like this devil, that takes up two leadership. Gargoyle, okay. So we can either take a combination of a gargoyle or demon, or devil rather, and one cultist or possessed one, or we can take three small units. For this stage, I think I'm going to go with, we already have casting taken care of, I don't really need another one. We're going to go with a possessed one as a melee fighter front line, and we're going to go with a gargoyle. For some, t for some extra tanking, and for ranged attack. Now keep in mind that in a fight, you can't attack the back row with melee attacks until the whole front row has been wiped out. So, even if I were to put him right here, it doesn't matter. He's very well protected, only magic and like ranged attacks like arrows can hit him. And arrows are pretty much the bane of mages. As you can see, he's got very low health. So now that we know that exactly uh, what units we're going to be using, unless I were to make another hero, I can know that I'll want the Unholy Portal and the Spire for upgrading them, but for now, I want to get the Temple right away. So that gives us the ability to pay for healing. So we're going to leave the city, and it's you hold down shift, that's it. If you hold down shift, you can see the flags of units to easily spot where they are. So this is a goblin and a goblin archer for the green skins, which is just a neutral party. Very easy to kill, very easy to get some experience from, but I think I would rather fight you, because you got treasure behind you. So this is how the combat system works. Everyone goes in, uh, it's turn-based and everyone goes in order of their initiative. If you have the same initiative as someone else, they roll to see who goes first. And the highest initiative in the game right now, or in this fight right now, is our gargoyle. Now, the top priority for me is to kill their, uh, their archers, because they can attack my leader. Luckily, this is a very easy fight. Oh, we missed there. Of course, he'd go straight for the weakest unit. There we go. We can do quite a dam bit of damage with the mage, but again, he uh, he has very, very low health, and he can only hit... Uh, he can hit every unit, but not specifically aim at anyone. It's good, but uh, he does the least damage of any hero, of the three main hero types, which I'll go over right before ending the episode. We don't have the money to make any of them, but the duke for us is our melee hero, he just fights in melee range, 50 damage by default, and he can use artifacts. All of our heroes but our thief, by the way, for the Legion of the Damned, fly, so they are unaffected by terrain. They can't take advantage of the speed boost of roads, but they also don't get slowed down by things that really slow you down, like trees or water, especially. We have our scouting hero, which is basically an archer, 40 damage, and he can attack anyone from the back row. He starts off being able to use tribal items, which are pretty rare. And the Archdevil, which is what we have. He can use staffs and scrolls and orbs from the beginning. And he attacks range, uh, just big area for 30 damage. And of course, sometimes you do a little bit more. The Baroness, she's our rod planting hero, 
runs expand your territory you own so that she can take over resources for us. She can only have one person with her, so she's not really meant for combat. Once we have the guilds, we can make thieves. They can't even level up in this game, or I believe they can level up, but they don't gain like abilities, and they can't gain leadership. So they can't actually lead anyone, they're very weak, expendable heroes meant for using espionage tactics on your opponent. Or for scouting. So, I guess that's it for the first episode, I explained most of the game and how you play. I forgot you could toggle that, yeah I'll keep that toggled. And we've used up all of our movement points for this turn. It looks like we're a little bit hurt, that red there is of course how hurt you are, if it were to get to the top, you'd be dead. And we've won one battle. Also, leaves a little tombstones, goblin, defeated by Madurai Bread. It says the leader of the party that defeated him, and it says um, the leader of the party who died, which was goblin. Really interesting, cool little thing about this game. Also, this is our land. Our land is, of course, the lava and rock spires, and that is go a gold source, which means as long as our land is covering that, we get 50 gold per turn off of it, which is very good. So, uh, I guess that is it for this episode. So, and that's just to check how much we're getting per turn. So, thank you all for watching, and until next time, have a nice day.